take a moment to pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful this morning to be able to come into your house, to be in your presence, to worship you. We pray now, Father, that you will bless each one here and those that are listening by way of the internet with your Holy Spirit. Please, Father, baptize us afresh this morning. Fill us with your spirit. Wash us, cleanse us in that precious blood of Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, when we have sinned against you in word or in deed. We humbly ask these things in the name of your dear son and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I hope that everyone had a wonderful week. I uh, personally have, uh, I've enjoyed this time, actually, you know, this time of uh, solitude, of being able to um, spend more time with God. You know, the Bible says that God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And even in the midst of this pandemic, even in the midst of this uh, turmoil that the country is going through, uh, God has not abandoned us. He has drawn closer to us. And um, I have really, as I said, I've enjoyed the time, um, being able to spend more time with God. We actually have no excuse now, do we? Um, you know, I c encourage everyone to take advantage of this, to uh, reestablish your connection with God, to examine yourselves, to make sure that you are within the faith. Uh, today, <clears throat> I would like you to turn in your Bibles to our scripture reading. The title of this sermon is All Present Truth is Not Pleasant Truth. Did you get that? All Present Truth is Not Pleasant Truth. If you turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 2, we're going to start reading in verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And the Holy Scripture reads, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they shall believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, in belief of the truth. If you think about um, some of the situations in the Bible, some of the times in the Bible where individuals were giving, given present truth that turned out to be, for them anyway, not pleasant truth, um, in my mind I can think of a few people. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, for one. Nebuchadnezzar told, was told that... Um, his kingdom would be taken from him and that he would be um, relegated to wandering ab amongst the beasts for seven years. At that time, do you think that was present truth? Yes, it was present truth. Do you think it was pleasant truth to Nebuchadnezzar? Probably not. How about um, Saul? You know, Saul was sent... Um, Samuel came to Saul, and he had to give Saul a message that the kingdom God had set him up with was going to be taken from him. Saul didn't like the message that Samuel had given him, and as Samuel turned to walk away, Saul reached out and grabbed his garment, his mantle, and tore it. And Saul says to, Samuel says to Saul, just as you have torn this garment of mine, God has torn the kingdom from you and will give it to someone 
better than you. That was present truth. And I'm sure to Saul, it was unpleasant truth. Um, Think of Judas even. Judas, uh, the one who betrayed Christ, made a deal with the rulers of his day to betray the Savior. As they sat around the table, and they all asked the questions, when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, they all said, is it I? Is it I? Even Judas, to throw off suspicion, said, is it I? Jesus said, the one who dips into the dish with me, he it is that will betray me. And it would be better if that man were never to have been born. At the time, that was present truth. And for Judas, I'm sure, unpleasant truth. Think of Noah. Noah was given a message to give to the people. For 120 years, Noah preached, it's going to rain. That was present truth. Today, that wouldn't be present present truth, but it's truth. It's biblical truth, but it wouldn't be present truth. Only eight people listened to that truth and obeyed that truth and were saved from the destruction that came upon the earth. So the point that I'm making is sometimes in life we're going to hear things that may not appear to be very pleasant for us. Nevertheless, it is necessary. It is pertinent. What do I mean by pleasant, present truth? Present, present truth is truth that is applicable to the times that we're living in. Do you agree with that? Truth that is pertinent to the very time that we're living in. And we are living in the last days. So the truth that we desperately need to hear today is what we would call present truth. One of the most precious messages that has ever been given to God's people was given to us in 1888. The message was, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. It is a message that has sometimes been lost sight of by us as a people. And it's a message that that you actually should never get tired of hearing. You know, uh, justification is what we're told is our title to heaven. But sanctification is our fitness for heaven. And oftentimes, you know, um, we might, would like to skip the preliminaries. You know, I I remember hearing a guy uh, speak to his beloved, and he said, you know, uh, perhaps maybe we could skip the preliminaries uh, of getting married and move straight to the honeymoon. She was not in agreement with that. You know, we need to sometimes look at things that may not necessarily be pleasant for us to look at. And right now, we're in a situation in this country where things are happening. They're happening not just in this country, but all over the world. And I have to talk to you um, plainly, as plainly as I can. I have been asked, James, why don't you let this thing go? You you become obsessed with this, this racial thing that is going on in the country. You know, and I thought about this. You know, one individual has told me that I am trying to drag the church into uh, an area that the church shouldn't go. And uh, I respectfully disagree with those individuals, but I do respect their um, opinions or their choices to make those, uh, situ- those decisions. The thing that I'm trying to emphasize to people strongly today you know, if you've been to a doctor as of late or any time in your history, what is one of the first things that they ask you to do? They give you a clipboard, and on that clipboard is a sheet of paper, and they're asking you for your family medical history. They want to know what type of things did your family, did your father, did your mother, did your grandfather have in their history? They need a baseline. So with spiritual things. We also sometimes need to have a history or look at our history. You know, someone much wiser than me said, those who forget the past are destined to repeat it. And uh, we have constantly been told, you notice when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, 
God was always telling them, take some stones from the river, from the Jordan River, take those stones and bring them out, set them up as a monument so that you don't what? Forget. Amen? You know, even the fourth commandment starts out, remember the Sabbath day. God is big on history. And in order sometimes to see where we're going, we need to realize and understand from whence we came. If we don't understand where we came from, sometimes the vision is not as clear where we're going. So the reason that I have been so passionate about the things that are going on is because if we do not really unpack how we got here, it's going to be difficult understanding how to move forward and where we're to go, where we're to go as we move forward. So um, I have to tell you, I am going to give to you what it is that God gives to me. And uh, the Bible says, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. You can do with it as you will, of course. If you know a little bit about our church history, there's a man by the name of William Miller from whom the Seventh-day Adventists grew out of, the Millerite movement, it's called. He began preaching in 1831 about the coming of Christ. At that time, there was also a, name, a man by the name of William Garrison. He was an abolitionist. You know, as I've had this time to reflect and to study, I've listened to some of our church historians and the things that they've had to say about our church and how our church developed. And I was surprised to understand or to hear that there was a, 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 a entwining of two movements. William Garrison was an abolitionist. And after 1832, many of the individuals that joined that Millerite movement were abolitionists. They, they were inseparable. And I was surprised to hear or to learn many of the things that um, I learned being locked down as we've been about the history of our church. And when you look at how entwined those two movements were, you cannot help but to notice that it's important to understand from whence we came. How did we get here as a people? And when you look at the time period that this church, this church was raised up, remember it was 1860 that we uh, officially adopted the name Seventh-day Adventists. It was 1863 that we formed as a church. Now, it was that same year, 1863, January 1, that Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation of Proclamation. This church was birthed in the midst of a social movement or social injustices in America. You, we, we can't escape that. And for anyone to think that somehow, since the Emancipation of Proclamation or the ending of slavery, all systemic racism kind of just disappeared, I would have to disagree agree with that. I would have to disagree. After slavery, we had Jim Crow. After Jim Crow, we had now mass incarceration. So there's always been something to replace that which went before it. And so we are not going to be able to leave this planet without dealing with some things that are very prevalent to us today. I asked myself, Lord, what was it about this current situation, this, this recent tragedy that happened to George Floyd? What was it about that thing that, that has gotten the world seeing things perhaps as they have never seen them before? Why this thing, Lord? There's been things that have happened before, and there's been things that have happened afterward. What was it about that one thing that has the world in this state today? You know, I, I would be um, not truthful if I didn't say that even within our own church, within this church, things have, have come to surface. Things have changed somewhat. Individuals have said things and have um, made mention of things that I would have never thought I would have heard before this. And somehow, time, sometimes I, I, somehow I just can't help to think that 
God has allowed this situation to bring to the surface some things that, have may, that may be hidden, things that need to be dealt with. In order for us to have that sanctification process take place, in order for us to be fitted to live in heaven, there are some things that we're going to have to deal with. There are some things that we have to come to grips with. And as I said in the title, all present truth is not always pleasant truth. You know, personally myself, um, when God brings revelation to me about things that are in my life, things that need to be changed, they must be changed in order for me to see his face in peace. Initially, when those things come to me, sometimes I am hesitant, I am resistant. I'm, I'm, I'm Lord, are you talking about me? Lord, are you sure? And God never makes mistakes, does he? And, and when he shows us, you know, see, it's been my experience that God doesn't just kick the door down of our hearts. He comes in and just says, you know, I've got to take this, I've got to take that, I've got to take this, this has to go, that has to go. My experience has been that God shows me by way of the Holy Spirit. He shows me areas and things in my life that need to be removed. And when he shows those things to you or to me, we look at them, and hopefully the response is, Lord, I would rather have Jesus than that. I would rather have Jesus than that. And, and he will say, James, can I, can I take this from you? He is still the, the, the master physician, and he still brings healing to his people. To all those who will invite him to come in, God comes in and he heals those areas in our lives that need to be healed. We are all suffering from different things that we have picked up just living in this world. We have picked up uh, uh, habits. We have picked up things that, that are not like him. And the Bible says we are to be holy because he is holy. And it is the Holy Spirit's job to reveal to us those areas in our lives that are so out of sync with Jesus. And when he reveals those things to us, he will not just take them without our permission. So oftentimes, we see things about ourselves, and they're not things that we like, but they are necessary. They're necessary to see so that that process of sanctification can continue, and then we can be able to see his face in peace when he cracks the sky. God is not just going to sweep things under the rug and ignore things that are so evident in our lives. Maybe things that we don't even know. You know, the Bible says the heart above all things is deceitful and it is desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, we may not necessarily know ourselves as well as we think we do. And sometimes situations have to occur, storms have to arise in order for us to see things that we might not otherwise have seen. And it is very pertinent, present truth, things that we have to see, things that we have to know in order for Christ to take those things out of our lives and to make us more like him. You know, I was thinking about this this morning, and I don't know if you agree with me, but just hear me out on this. Heaven is not the end all for the Christian. As important as going to heaven is, it is not the end all for the Christian. And what I mean by that is, if you look in John chapter 17, verse 3, Christ says, Father, he says he has finished the work. He says, this is life eternal, that they may know God. You know, eternal life is knowing God. And he says, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Heaven is just the place where we are going to spend eternity. But if Jesus is not there... Would heaven be heaven for you? In fact, I, I want to I ask another question. If, if a voice from heaven came this morning and said, the vacancy sign has now been hung out, when you die, you will not be coming to heaven. There is no more room. Would you still continue to live the Christian lifestyle? Would you continue doing what you have been doing, hopefully, since you met Christ? Do you agree that the Christian lifestyle is the best life to live regardless? Heaven is just the place where we are going to spend eternity. But being made 
back into the image of God, becoming fully aware of who he is, acquainted with him, to be made known by him and known of him, that is, that is far more important than simply where you would spend eternity. Heaven could easily be under a bridge in a cardboard box if Jesus is there. You know, so for those who think it's all about me getting to heaven, it's all about, you know, me getting a, a change of, of address, an, an upgrade in my real estate, I think maybe you need to reassess what this thing is all about. Because ultimately, what the gospel is to do, it is to transform us from what we had been before we met Christ, like unto him. We, we talked about this the last time I spoke, that, that when he comes, the Bible says, we shall see him as he is because we will be like him. Amen? That's what it's all about, being made like him. You know, it's about uh, character. The last sermon I preached was character lives matter. If we know every one of the 28 fundamental doctrines that we believe as a people, backwards and forward, in every other way, if we are not like Jesus when he comes, there will be some unpleasant truth that we will have to hear. No words I can imagine can be more devastating to any person than to hear, depart from me. Workers of iniquity, I never knew you. I don't, even, I don't even want to think about anyone having to hear that. So in order for that not to be what we hear in the end, there are things that we have to look at. There are things that we have to deal with. There are things that we have to allow God to deal with in our lives. You know, and it, it seems to me that everyone nowadays seems to be an expert on almost everything. And, and if we're not, then we could just, what, Google it. We can run to the Internet and just go to Google and find out almost anything and everything that we want to know. But there's some things that you can't find out from Google. You cannot find out the things that may be hidden within our hearts. Christ will come in and sup with us. Christ will come in and he will take this beautiful, loving, celestial light that he brings with him. And it will illuminate every dark place in our lives, in our hearts. And it has to be that way. And some of that illumination sometimes, you notice sometimes if, if you've been in a dark room for a while and you step out into the light, what is one of the first things you do? You cover your eyes. The light is too bright. It can also be sometimes painful, right? But as your eyes adjust, you begin to see things as they are. And I liken the Holy Spirit to that experience as well. Sometimes there's things that we have to see about ourselves that make us uncomfortable. Nevertheless, they have to be viewed, and they have to be viewed through the eyes of Christ. And he loves us far too much, far too much, simply to ignore some character defects. And there's nothing like a crisis sometimes to reveal our character. Crisis does not create character. It reveals it. And it's been my experience that some of the things that, that come up in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of a storm in my life, have not been things that uh, I may have been aware of or things that I may have even wanted to deal with. Some of us may be carrying baggage even that goes back prior to uh, prenatal. You know, we are, are, are some, nothing more than the sum total of the experiences that we've had in life. That's what we are. And none of us have come into this world as Christians, as children of God. It is by adoption that we become children of God. It is by allowing him to come into our hearts and to be the boss of us. My Bible says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, we as a people was given a message to give to the world. And in fact, the, re the way it reads in the spirit of prophecy is this message was commanded by God to be given. It is Christ's 
our righteousness. You know, but I, I have to tell you today, justification by faith is far more than just a doctrine that we believe. Justification by faith is something that we experience. Justification by faith is allowing God to come into our lives and do that which only he can do. We're told by the servant of the Lord, justification by faith is God taking the glory of man and laying it in the dust where it belongs and doing for him that which he cannot do for himself. We desperately need to hear that present truth. And for some, it will be unpleasant truth. The reason it will be unpleasant truth is because somehow, even unaware, we may have assigned merit to some of the things we do. Our Sabbath keeping, our eating habits, our dress habits, some of the things that we do which are simply the fruits of having been justified. Sometimes we make the fruits more important than the tree from whence they come. The Holy Spirit is not a co-redeemer. The Holy Spirit is the facilitator. He is the one who makes the life of Christ real to us. He is the one that replicates the life of Christ in us. But nothing that the Holy Spirit does is meritorious. Jesus is the Savior, and Jesus alone is the Savior. You were saved from the penalty and the punishment of sin 2,000 years ago. And as you submit yourself to the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, he will come in and recreate or reproduce the very life of Christ, the character of Christ, so that we can see God in peace when he comes. All truth, all present truth, is not always going to be pleasant to you or to me. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. In fact, anyone that chooses to live godly, the Bible says, you will suffer persecution. The thing that surprises us sometimes is that it does not always come from without. Sometimes it comes from within. Jesus said, a man's worst enemy will be of his own household. The Bible has told us we are in perilous times. We are in very difficult times. But the good news is, Christ says, I have walked this path before you. I know every pitfall, every trap that the enemy of souls has set up. And I will make sure that you get through to the other side. My Bible says we can be confident of this very thing that he who has begun this good work in us, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. But we have to be willing to trust him. We have to be willing to know him as he truly is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I read this scripture before to you. It talks about another Jesus or another spirit or another gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 In verse 4, it says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You know, sometimes we can manufacture in our own minds. In fact, this is what man has done almost from the very beginning, the fall. Man has made up gods that do not exist. In fact, if the, you know, the God that we serve says, if there's another God, I don't know him. You know, he says, I am he. I alone am he. But if you look back through history, man has manufactured gods of his own choosing, of his own making and has worshipped them. Is it possible that we have done the same thing with Jesus? Is it possible that we sometimes are worshipping a Jesus of our own choosing, of our own imagination? The Bible is very clear on who Jesus is. But remember, Jesus himself had to ask the question to his disciples. Whom do men say that I am? 
And of course, the disciples said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say Elias. Some say another prophet. But then Jesus gets even more personal. He says, but who do you say? Who do you say that I am? This time Peter got it right. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed that unto you, but your father, our father, which is in heaven. Shortly after that, Jesus began telling Peter and the disciples what was going to happen to him, what was going to befall him. I'm going to be taken to Jerusalem. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be mistreated. I'm going to be crucified. And three days later, Peter said, whoa, 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 stop. Jesus, stop. What are you saying? Surely this is not going, no, no. Shortly after Jesus had said to him, Peter, you have had a heavenly revelation. He then had to say to him, get ye behind me, Satan. Do we learn anything from that? Do we understand that maybe, even after we have come into this, 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 this body, this remnant church, as we call it, even after we have learned all these wonderful truths, which are very important, is it possible, maybe, that we are so out of step with the Jesus of the Bible that we are worshiping a Jesus of our own imaginations, of our own choosing? The Jesus of the Bible is going to cause you sometimes to be uncomfortable. The Jesus of the Bible is sometimes going to enter into areas of your lives that you might not otherwise want him to go. But it's necessary. And for us as a people, if we are going to fulfill the commission that God has raised this church up to do, then sometimes we have to go back and look at our history and see how did we get here? How did we get here? What is it that God is trying to show us, to tell us, that he will be able to uh, get us to see things and to heal things that need to be seen and need to be healed so that we can see him as he is when he comes and say to him, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Because you will say either that or you will say to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us. Crush us, hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne from the wrath of the Lamb, for his day has come, and who shall be able to stand? What's the answer to that question, sister? Those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Those who have allowed God to enter into those dark corners of their lives, of their hearts, and to bring to the surface, you know, um, the ocean is an interesting place. Many, many ships lay at the bottom of the ocean. And it seems like after every hurricane, you know, sediment and things get stirred up. And things sometimes on the bottom of the ocean are revealed, sometimes treasures. As we go through this life, cancer, pandemics, different things, different storms are going to stir up things that may be in our lives that have been hidden. And once they have been stirred up and brought to the surface, and we see the ugly truths of some of the things that we may not have known were there, Christ will then ask permission. Sister Emir, can I take this from you? Brother Doug, can I remove this from you? Craig, I found something here. This, this, this storm has, has revealed I love you so much. Can I, can I take this from you? Cindy, I have something that I'd like to say to you. And as Simon said, say on, Lord. Everything that Jesus does for us, everything that he does is for our own good. He truly has our best interest at heart. He will never say anything or do anything intentionally to hurt us. He often had to speak words that on the surface appeared to be Harsh. You go to Matthew chapter 23 and he called individuals, you hypocrites, vipers. Was Jesus being mean? No. Every word that he spoke was spoken from a place of love. With tears in his voice, he had to bring rebuke to individuals. And he has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God will bring to us uncomfortable things, 
very present truth, but sometimes unpleasant truth. Nevertheless, these things have to be dealt with. And I think what we're seeing going on in this, on this planet today, the unrest. You know, I, I have to say something, because see, in some of the discourses that I've had with individuals, they are quick to point out, well, what about this, this the, the, the rioting and the looting and the burning and all these things? And I say, you know, are we not students of history? When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, did the enemy of souls try to co-opt that movement? Was it a legitimate movement that was started by God? Was God the one who sent Moses down to talk to Pharaoh and say, let my people go? The movement, the exodus from Egypt was God's ideal. But there were a people that joined themselves to that movement. They were called the what? The mixed multitude. Those were the individuals that said, Lord, Moses, were there not enough graves in Egypt? We could have easily just died in Egypt at the hand of our taskmasters. Did you have to bring us all the way out here into the wilderness to die, Moses? Was there a, an attempt by the enemy to co-opt that movement? I say yes. Fast forward even to Jesus. There was an individual that came to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, he said, you know, birds have nests. Foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Jesus tried to dissuade an individual for, from attaching themselves to that group, to that movement. Jesus said, you know what? Have I not chosen, all, chosen you? But one of you is what? A devil. Did Jesus choose Judas? No. The disciples thought, oh, he, he, we could really use him. He has so many talents. We could really use him. He would be welcomed amongst us. He would be an asset to us. Did the enemy of souls try to co-opt the very movement even that Christ himself started? Yes, he did. How about 1844, the end of the 2300 days? There were individuals that joined themselves to that movement. They were fanatics. They were really not part of those true believers. And on October 23rd, when Jesus did not come and there was this great disappointment, those individuals, well, you know, we never really believed that anyway. Not really, you know. Uh, we always had our suspicions about this thing. You know, did the enemy of souls try to co-opt that movement? So would you not expect him to do the same thing today? He doesn't have anything new. All he seems to do is repackage his stuff and resubmit it. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon tells us. So don't be fooled by individuals who join themselves sometimes to a movement. There were those that did that then, and there are those who will do it now. Even John dealt with it. He said, you know what? If they were of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out because they were not what? They were not of us. Jesus brings people to the church. He says, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Does the enemy also bring people to the church? Did Jesus talk about a group of people he called terrorists? I preached a sermon one time I called the wheat and the terrorists. There's terrorists in the church. And sometimes those terrorists could be even more dangerous, more harmful than the terrorists that simply want to take your life outside. The ones that sometimes join themselves to the church, they come in to take far more than just your life. They want to steal and to kill and to remove you from the roll book in heaven. That's their sole purpose, whether they know it or not. Satan is always trying to co-opt the movement of righteousness and movements that God starts or raises up. So don't get fooled by some of the people that are doing things that are very, very wrong. But to walk and to ask for justice, to walk and to ask for fair treatment, to walk and to ask that injustice stop and that brutality stops, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. God is very big on justice. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21, God says he is a just God. Psalms chapter 89, verse 14, I believe, he says his very throne 
is established on what? Justice and judgment. God is big on justice. So if you think that somehow that his church, his remnant church, should not be involved in social justice or social movements, I think that you have missed it. God expects his people to make an impact. He says we are to let our light shine. We're not to just sit back and hope that people will come to us so that we can give them far more information than they ever had. We can tell them, sister, about what day they should be worshiping on. We can tell them, brother Doug, about what they should be eating. We can tell them about the 2,300 days. But you know what they want to know? What was it that the Greeks said when they came to the disciples? We would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. And the world still needs to see Jesus more now than ever. They need to see Jesus in you. They need to see Jesus in me. Jesus himself said, "If and when I am lifted up, I will draw all to me. Brother Craig, when Jesus is lifted up in your life, individuals will be drawn to the Jesus that they see in you. When Jesus is lifted up properly in our lives, he is like a love magnet. He just draws people to him. There are so many people that are hurting in this world. They need to see Jesus. So today I tell you, reassess your relationship with Jesus. First and foremost, make sure that you're worshiping the Jesus of the Bible not the Jesus of your own imagination. See, and how will you know? How can you tell? Well, if the Jesus that you're worshiping allows you to remain comfortable, perhaps maybe you may not have the right Jesus. Because the Jesus that I know oftentimes makes me very uncomfortable. He loves me so much, he's willing to make me uncomfortable. And he has to make me uncomfortable sometimes. He has to show me things about me that I didn't see or I refused to see. So if you've been having problems with anything that I have spoken or have said as of late, as the Bible says, examine yourselves. If it's the way I've said some things, maybe that's my fault, that can be changed. If it's what I've said, and what I have said is, if it's sound and if it's biblical, Maybe you need to examine yourself. The Bible says we are to search the scriptures to see if these things be so. The scriptures are what we are to measure everything by. And Jesus said to people, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you gave me clothes. Seems to me these are all social issues. And he also has to say to those, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you just passed by on the other side. You didn't give me a drink. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. Lord, where, 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 when did this happen? What are you talking about, Jesus? Wherein you have done this to the least of these, you've done it to me. Everything that you do, everything that I do, whether it be good or whether it be bad, Jesus takes it personal. Paul had to find out through his experience, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, Saul, whom you are persecuting. Everything that we do reflects upon us. See, in the end, your picture of God will be lived out in your life. Who you think God is, who you believe God to be, will be lived out in your life. And as the world is being polarized into two camps, Malachi 3.18 says, Then they shall return, and then the time will come when individuals will see those who serve God and those who serve him not. The time is coming when the individuals that kill you, the Bible says, will think that they offer God a service. 
the lamb-like beast of Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, has been speaking almost from the foundation of this country, from the civil side, as a dragon. But soon, that voice will turn to the religious side. And if you did not stand up when he was speaking as a dragon, and his tirade was against other people, what will happen when he switches to speaking like a dragon on the religious side and his tirade is against you? He will come for you. He will come for you. Gracious Father, please help us to understand. Indeed, we are in the midst of perilous times, and we need to have your Holy Spirit more than anything, Lord. We need to know truth from error. We need to know right from wrong. We're told, Lord, that those who do not have the oil in their lamps will not be able to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. Lord, oftentimes individuals have thought that they were on the right path. They have thought that they were doing your will only to find out. Deception is called deception for a reason. So Father, we come to you this morning humbly asking you to direct us, to fill us, to order our steps, Lord, in the word. Order our steps, Lord. Help us to walk humbly with our God. You said, have you not shown us what is required? Lord, please help us to love mercy, to keep your commandments, to walk humbly with our God. Prepare us, Lord, to say to the people, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Lord, we need you more now than ever. Please help us heal the divisions, even within this church. Heal our hearts. Do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. We humbly ask this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. And all of the saints said, amen. God bless you.